Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. On today's show, we speak with Jim Dunn, president at Stack Modular, a Vancouver-based construction company that manufactures, in China, modular buildings for residential, hospitality, and commercial uses. They are then shipped all over the world, so fully ready to go, Jim says you could live in one comfortably during transportation. The art is on the wall, and the sheets are on the bed. Then, when they arrive at their destination, they stack them up like Lego in whatever configuration the buyer needs. Stack Modular has been covered in the New York Times, Business Insider, and Huffington Post, to name a few. We talk about the unique budgetary, logistical, and labor-related challenges that come with the territory for Stack Modular, why the construction industry has yet to undergo major innovations in 2021, and how the pandemic has impacted Stack Modular's business operations both inside and outside China. Is this the future of housing in the 21st century? Listen and find out. Enjoy. Do I think that there's like opportunities for mid-range like 3D printing and panel-type companies to come in? For sure. I don't know if our jurisdictions, our city council, so uh, you know, our building inspectors, I don't know if they're ready for it. Like if I say to you, listen, I'm going to 3D print your house, you're going to have to convince the architect, the city official, the inspectors, like are they all ready for it? Because all you need is one person in this whole supply chain to say, nah, nah I'm not comfortable with that, and that building is not going to work. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early stage tech companies enter the Asia Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Todd. Good to be here. What is Stack Modular? What is the organization trying to accomplish? So we build modular buildings. And the difference being, because it's a common term around the world now, especially with, you know, today's political landscape and, and the housing crisis, you know, modular buildings are a solution. And so everyone kind of has, has an understanding now of what modular buildings are. The major difference in our business is we actually build the modular buildings, the Lego, if you will, in China. And we then ship them across the ocean to North America or other parts of the world. And in those destination cities, we stack them with a crane like Lego and you're getting a building substantially faster, better, stronger. That's the business. What are you using uh, to build them? But tell me a little bit, what are they made from? Why do they end up standing up and staying up and being stronger than regular buildings? Sure. Yeah. And I, I don't think they're necessarily like stronger than regular buildings. Like I'd put our steel framed modular business against any wood provider and, 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 and make that statement boldly. But when it comes to like steel versus conventional steel buildings, like your shopping mall at the street or concrete, you know, the, the difference being when you buy a modular building or build a modular building, you're actually getting two walls, two floors. So if you can imagine the box is traveling, it's already got its own floor, its own roof and its own walls, and you're stacking it next to an adjacent or above and below module, you're almost creating double structure, if that makes sense. So that would be the only kind of concept of it being stronger, but it's it's not a huge selling point to be stronger because the building code tells us how to build. You know, when you say modular, I know even that where where I live, a version of modular is almost, you know, in the sense of a Hong Kong or Japanese modular that inside the house, you can turn your living room into your bedroom. And, you know, just because this is an audio, this is a podcast, I want to try to paint the picture properly. We're not talking about modular in that inside your kitchen suddenly turns into your bathroom. This is a different type of modular. Can you paint a little bit better, like a little bit more detailed picture of what the modular means? Sure. So I would like encourage the listener to close their eyes and go back in time into their university dormitory or the last hotel room they stayed in, which unfortunately was probably a long time ago, pre-COVID. Uh, that's what they look like. The, the, I'm being a little facetious in my answer because the difference is zero. So our buildings will be built no different. Part of me will look no different than a Hyatt. You build a Hyatt in a modular format or you buy a Hyatt or build a Hyatt with concrete or steel or wood. It doesn't, you don't know. 
in our buildings if it's any different. Do you have a strong China presence? Well, yeah, that's, that's the be all and all of our business, right? Is in hopefully some of the listeners are not sitting in their Canadian offices, but you know, at the end of the day, we have to remember our, our strength and our roots and our roots and strength are the factory business of our, of our business. We build quality modules in China. Yes, we've got sales teams and architects and engineers and project managers sitting here in North America, executing those business, that, those business practices. But ultimately our product is what makes us who we are. And that's built in China. And we have a wonderful group of people. Um, we have our offices in Shanghai and our facilities are out in Jiangsu. And uh, that team is our, is our heartbeat, if you will. What does a typical customer look like to, you know, for your business? Well, I used to think it was the private sector. I used to think, you know, who was building the next Hyatt? And that, those were our clients and we did well there. You know, as of late, and specifically here in Canada, like we have a very conservative mindset here in Canada. And I don't mean that in the, like, <laughs> the liberal sense of the word, meaning like, you know, we have a conservative mindset, whether it's, you know, the banking system or construction systems. So like Canada's private sector is not flying off the hook for us. Like this is better, stronger, faster. I'm going to take it on. It doesn't happen here. We're seeing it in the public institutions right now. Like what Prime Minister Trudeau did recently in, in enacting a billion dollars of grant money to modular buildings to house homeless. That's our client now. What Infrastructure Ontario is doing in both long-term care and the prison sector, that it has to be modular. Like these public institutions, what BC Housing is doing to house homeless, it has to be modular. So our client is shifted, wrongly or rightly, kind of away from private sector into the public domain and our customers are now governments. It is counterintuitive to think that the public sector is more embraceive, more innovative, and is more open to adopting new styles of, of uh, building compared to the private sector. It, you listen, as a, as a libertarian, if you want to peg me with anything, it's disappointing. But at the same time, I'm talking on both sides of my mouth because I'm very happy that these governments are embracing our technology. How developed is the modular housing industry in China? How, do, how does it compare to that of, of the Western, uh, you know, U.S., Canada, EU? Like if you ask me that question when we started, you know, a dozen, a dozen years ago, I would say North America is more advanced. You know, we've been doing modular buildings for the resource sector for the better part of 40 or 50 years. You know, you don't find oil in downtown Vancouver, you found oil in Northern Alberta. So all of a sudden these remote housing and re modular requirements are very real. So I would have said 12 years ago, Canada is far advanced. We got com either complacent, but we didn't take that into the permanent modular world where you and I know that our hotels and dormitories and apartments and, and long-term care facilities, China did that. So over the last half a dozen years, China says to itself, wow, you can build a building faster, cheaper, stronger in a factory environment. And you know, China, you live there like I did. They act faster. So they saw something that made sense and they acted. Here in Canada, we're slow to act. So we're only seeing permanent modular construction, which is what we do very well at Stack. We've only recently seen that in you know, three, four, five years ago. And now in the last year, it's government. Is anybody even doing this over on this side of the ocean? Yeah, there's some wood guys some wood guys like not far from you in interior bc and um it's a tough business like these wood guys made a lot of money in, in building oil and gas guys and oil and gas is gone for you know it's not, hopefully not forever and uh so to move into the permanent world with wood modulars is a little bit more difficult we make we make a steel module so it, it's a little bit more conducive to permanent construction but to start a steel fabricator in canada and build these modules out of steel i believe the entry capital is just too cumbersome to start a plant in Canada. My, that's, that's why I see, I, I'm thinking we don't have a lot of competitors here. Does the cost of resources like materials or labor also impact or affect uh, the ability to start that over here and maybe why you're in China? But yeah, like, I don't think we were smart enough when we started. I mean, I just happened to be living in China. Like, but you know, if, you, if you gave me infinite cash today, I don't think I'd start a like if you give me infinite cash today, I don't think I would start a plant in Canada because your problem is still the same problem. Our issue in Canada is our labor forces are dwindling. 
demographics are getting older. Baby boomers are getting older, as is everyone. And we don't have people entering construction trades like we used to. So you don't have construction trades. That's, that's the problem in Canada. So now you're going to start a modular factory and try to get those same plumbers to come work for you in the plant. Well, the problem is they don't exist. So you're almost trying to solve a problem and then you're creating a problem for yourself as opposed to China. We have, you know, a, let's say unlimited source of labor. So we're solving that problem of a shortage of labor in Canada. So you're building, you know, as we're coming to understand, you're, you're building an entire operating household, almost like a, you know, a, in a container type of form. What are you employing all the same trades and, and everything that it would take would, to build a house? Yeah, absolutely. And just, just so we're clear, you, you owe our VP of sales five bucks because you call our business the container business. Yeah, I bet. There's a jar for that. You know, so a container typically is 320 square feet. An average module for us would be eight or 900 square feet. So if you saw a container going down the road, think three times bigger, that would be an average size of the container for efficiencies, right? You want to put a kitchen in there, a bathroom in there, and you want to put have high, nice ceilings. You know, the idea is, is that you don't want to try to reinvent North American architecture because you're shoving someone into a small hole. You need to, so that's kind of what I'm saying. And, but yes, to answer your question, they come over and let's, you know, let's say we're building a hotel. We will put bed sheets on the beds. We will put art on the wall. So that when these modules arrive and you stack them like Lego in San Francisco, that hotel room is done, done, done. And now you're just tying the modules together. Yeah, no, I understand. I, I immediately regretted using the word container because I didn't mean it as like a sea can. I meant it as something that holds something else. <laughs> but I immediately regretted. I thought, oh, a container. Yeah, like, a, OK, that's that's not going to fly. Uh, I can imagine that's a pain in the butt in your industry. Well, it's container housing is a, a sexy subject as well across magazines. And, and so... I think a lot of the reasons why we're seeing container housing in North America is because they're available. You don't have to start a steel fabrication plant. You don't have to hire welders. Like those old shipping containers are sitting in the junkyard. So I get that business. Unfortunately, that business doesn't do what we want it to do, right? We want to stack multiple high and build hotels that act and see no different. And the containers, you can't do that. So I like the business. It's just not the one we're in. Right. And so the tiny home, the tiny house craze... Uh, that's not you guys. No, no. I just, yeah, at risk of sounding a tad, you know, pompous. We're a little too big now to do that. Like we need to, we're a company that's now built on efficiency. We need to build a hundred of the same room, same hotel on the factory line. Bam, 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 bam. You start building tiny homes or single family housing or cabins. You're not getting those efficiencies that we look for and that we need. What kind of limitations uh, it's a broad question, but, you know, all kinds, everything in there. What limitations does modular housing have? Uh, and, you know, the, the ones that you've met, how have you overcome them? No, it's a great question because we designed a building backwards. So before, so say, for example, we're building you a hotel. You're going to say, I want, you know, 13 foot, 14 foot wide rooms. I want a bathroom. And we're saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our team actually inversely has to go look at, where you want to build your hotel. So if you want to build your hotel on Kamloops, pick a town. We have to actually look at the road infrastructure to get to Kamloops before we can start picking up a pen. Right? I can't promise you I can build you a 15-foot wide hotel room if there's street, side, street lights next to your project site. I'm going to knock them over. So you're actually looking at road restrictions before you're looking at architecture because it'll dictate how wide you can do a room. Um, I would say road restrictions are probably the biggest one that dictate kind of the early stages of design. After that, you're almost designing very similarly that you are to a normal product, product or at least conventional construction. You know, bathrooms are the same, bedrooms are the same. There's some small, there's some small nuances. The biggest, the biggest differentiator is that we need everyone in the same room. We got to think more like building a car. Than building the home. So you're building the building the building normally. You bring the concrete guy out, he does his job. Electricians come in and out, plumbers come in and out. But we're doing that all at the same time in the plant. So there's a little bit of difference that we need to be more integrated, like a car manufacturer. You never design a car with the wheel guy and the steering wheel guy not talking. Right? So we need the steering wheel guy and the tire guy in the same room before we go to production. And that's a little different. Very difficult for the construction industry 
to really take on because they're not used to that. You beat me to the punch a little bit to talk about logistics because a little bit I want to talk about how do you accomplish such logistics, especially if you're shipping overseas? Uh, what kind of trucking company does one call to come and pick this thing up at the port? Um, talk us through a little bit some of the challenges there. Yeah, it's, it's, sometimes I joke that we're a logistics business. Oh, yeah. Well, if you think like, I think the con- I think the shipping container was invented in Georgia in like 1954. Like it's not that long ago that the shipping container was invented. And here we are, you know, what's the map? And then it's 70 years later, we're shipping buildings across the ocean. Like the world wasn't necessarily ready for it. <laughs> yeah. You know, so the difference being, so in China, our trucking responsibilities are a little bit easier, right? You live there. I live there for a decade. You know, you're able to truck a little bit easier. Um, but once you get on the ocean vessel, so we don't rent shipping container vessels because shipping container vessels are very like very mathematically placed. The you know sixteen containers wide, ten containers tall. We rent we rent what's called break bulk vessels, mm. and like for lack of better description, because we're on a podcast and I can't draw a picture, not that I can draw anyways. Think of an aircraft carrier in top down, just for lack of better description. Think of a top down carrier with cranes on it. We rent that thing. Cover it in building Lego blocks, huge Lego blocks, and then that vessel travels across the ocean to a port city. You got to make sure that port city is willing to receive these great big vessels. And then you start working with trucking companies that they're able to pull this off the vessel and ultimately get it to site. Because throughout that entire sequence and supply chain, all you need is one bump, one missed thought, one jerk. And the whole project's around. I was going to say that not only are we dealing with this 3D parallelogram, but we're also, you know, it's not like you're putting the art on the wall before it leaves and then it falls off when it gets there. So uh, like uh, the guts of this thing as well, how much can you prefab? How do you have to take precautions to make sure that all the wiring and plumbing doesn't go awry? And then what do you have to do once it hits the destination? Yeah, so that that all sucks, right? For lack of a better English term. Lack of a better English term. Yeah. Like, there's no book. There's no dummies book. There's no building code. There's no Bible. There's no one done this before. So there's no like, hey guys, this is how you wire a light switch so that it can go across an ocean and the salt water won't affect it and it won't fall off the wall. Like there's no book. The only way you figure it out is by failing. Trial and error. Failure. And you know, you and I got to speak before we got on today about our China stories, like. That failure creates scar tissue. And the key to entrepreneurship is remembering how you got that scar. That's the key. And in our case, we've got thousands of scars that we just don't repeat. And now I can look anyone in the eye and say, yeah, you want to you hire a five-star hotel in San Francisco? No problem. Yeah. So can you, can you talk a little bit about the things that you do before you leave? I mean, obviously, furniture goes in upon destination. Yeah. So like you, in theory could sleep in the room as it's coming across like the free, like wow. I'm sure you don't have sure you don't have electricity and Wi-Fi, but you could sleep in the room with the comforter on the bed, artwork in the wall, silverware in the drawers as the modules are on the back of the boat and truck and crane being placed in. Okay. In theory. Yeah. So that's that's the great visual right there. That that really it's just um okay. So that's that's pretty awesome. Um you probably pay attention to, um, I'm, I'm assuming, I could be wrong, but a little bit of the 3D printing world. Because yeah. I know they've been dabbling in trying to get some of this kind of stuff right. Is is 3D printing, you know, getting into the, the you know, home manufacturing world? I hope so. I, listen, there's, there's a lot of people entering the space. And, and worsely, a lot of people who have entered this space that have failed. Because it's a sexy spot right now. Like people have reinvented every industry that you and I use every day, whether it's communication, technologies, textiles, agriculture, everything's been reinvented except for construction. And, and you know, every millennial and every young person right now wants to reinvent and be the new it. And construction construction is the low hanging fruit if you look across at every industry. That one hasn't been changed yet. So, you know, you got the Kateras who raised five and a half billion or something from SoftBank and they're now dwindling to nothing. How you go through five and a half billion in three years is beyond me. Do I think that there's like opportunities for mid-range like 3D printing and panel type companies to come in? For sure. 
I don't know if our jurisdictions, our city council, so uh, you know, our building inspectors, I don't know if they're ready for it. Like if I say to you, listen, I'm gonna 3D print your house, you're gonna have to convince the architect, the city official, the inspectors, like are they all ready for it? Because all you need is one person in this whole supply chain to say, nah, I'm, not, I'm uncomfortable with that, and that building is not going forward. Yeah, and there's one other industry that would you'd have to probably convince, which is the other industry that I think has yet to be disrupted and needs to be disrupted, which is insurance. Oh, God bless you for saying that. Oh, yeah. And legal. Can we throw legal in there too? I guess we are having some legal websites come online where you get like free or five bucks. Yeah, legal and tax are slowly, slowly coming around. Slowly come around. And then we got to innovate politics in general. I actually have... A cutout on my wall. I'm McDavid Jersey. I got a Mona Lisa or something. And then the other one is the Economist article from probably 2016, 17. I got a cutout on my wall. It's all crinkled now. They yell at it. And it shows the major sectors in America and how they've innovated since the 60s. I think it's the 60s. So, like, agriculture is like 500%. Like, you know, our great grandparents were literally planting seeds with potatoes. And now you got machines doing this and irrigation equipment. Like it's crazy. Textile, same thing. Like grandma was sewing her shirts and now we're, you know, buying it from Bangladesh. Like it's crazy. Construction's actually gone down in productivity, gone down since the 60s. Like that's that, you know, that's amazing. It is, so it is. Then let me ask you a question on, you know, cost and feasibility. Like if the Hyatt or the Intercontinental or somebody wants to come in and do it, they got the bucks, they can do it at scale. How necessary is it to be able to do it at scale? If I want to put a fourplex on a piece of land that I've got, can I can I get in on a on a shipment? Can I get it? Can I get a few of those sent over here and and get myself a fourplex? Yeah, it's the same question you're going to have to ask um, some of the larger manufacturers that are way stronger. And how dare I compare myself to like an Apple or a Ford Motor Company? You know, hey guy, hey Ford, can I have a five door car? I know you're like going to kick out 2,000 of these four-door sedans all day, but can I have a five-door car? I don't know if the conversation would go very well, um, but I'm being tap facetious because we're not Ford and you know, God bless we ever are. And I really don't want you to change what you have. I just only want four. No, I know. It's, it's a great question because I've never really come up with a solid answer because we get the request every day. So the question would be, can our sales team gather... 15 orders of four plexes and then all of a sudden make it economical and, and make sense to run the factory line. And you know, we got to carry designers over top of every project, project managers, engineers, safety. We got to carry all this staff over top of four, a fourplex. Maybe we did over 15 fourplexes, but here I am being classes half empty. Am I really going to find 15 people that want the same fourplex? So that gives me an idea of the purchasing scale that you would need to be able to overcome all the costs that are involved of, of really doing this. I know that even where I live on some luxury sites around the lake, that companies are now building, they're building apartments or residences strictly for Airbnb. They're yeah, modular yeah. in nature. So they just turn a living room into a bedroom. They come with everything. You buy it and then you rent it out. It's got the sheets. It's got the cutlery. Everything is in there. The pots and pans, the salt and pepper. It's all in there. And yeah. so they're building and deploying these things. This is an industry I've been keeping an eye on because I'm very, very interested not to buy one, but to build a building, maybe to get a group together. It is Anybody who thinks along those lines, are you a good person to get in touch with? Yeah, I think that our, our group, if you're going to, if you want a quick, efficient, high quality structure built quickly and effectively open up that rent revenue a year sooner, you know, I don't know of any better. I'm quite close to the mirror on that answer, but I, I don't know of any better. You know, and here I am kind of saying we don't do the cabins and the fourplexes. We used to. And I, and I did like it. But, you know, to my point earlier, and, you know, you and I were chatting about scar tissue and failure, like, you don't just fail because you hung the light switch the wrong way. You also fail in other ways, realizing, oh, my God, we should have never built that fourplex two years ago. Because if you look back on what we missed out on or what we actually carried on the soft cost side, it wasn't actually worth it. So that's scar tissue, right? we got to grow as a business to realize the onesies and twosies. 
they may be they may be for you. There might be some small facility outside Vernon, British Columbia, that wants to build cabins, and that's a great business. Um, we're just unfortunately in China and built a little bit larger scale business. That's all. How many of your customers? Uh, what percentage of customers are local in China versus abroad? Zero in China. Yeah, why? How is that? Hey, listen, I, we talked about a little bit earlier that to start a modular facility or plant in Canada, you're not really solving the issue at hand, which is no labor. Well, firstly to that, I think I had this sort of plant in China that caters to the Chinese market. I don't have that labor value versus conventional construction with the street, right? We're, we're both paying the plumber the same. Inversely, we go ahead, listen, it comes down to financials. Americans and Canadians are going to pay way more for a structure. That's the bottom line. I'm, I'm dancing around the point. Because some guy in Vancouver is going to pay 400 bucks a square foot to build a hotel. I'll do that all day versus selling it into Dalian, selling some $150 square foot project. No, that's the difference. Yeah, I, I think it does just come down to the economics, um, yeah. you know, up and down on the production side of things, really. But, uh, but again, I've, I've lied to you yet again, because we did do a cabin last year and I did it for my wife and I and her kids. So, you know, once in a while when the factory is slow and there's a little bit, of, little bit of room over there in the corner, you know, friends and family maybe maybe be able to sneak in there. Right. It just, it, it, it fell off the back of the truck <laughs> near the Shushwap Lake and yeah. we just, yeah, decided to put it on there. We sort of bought our cabins. We bought uh, some acres here on the island just, you know, minutes from Vancouver. And um, I, had to be, I had to be in China. At the time, actually, we were living in China. So I had to be there. And we were something for business. I think we we're building a big project in, in the plant. So I said to my pregnant wife, I said to her, babe, our cabin's arriving off the ship. You know the process of the ship now. I'm going to need you to handle this. And she said, it's the obvious answer. I'm pregnant. I said, no, no, no. I'll get you some help. So I call her brother, my brother-in-law. He helps out. I call her, I call her sister, my sister-in-law. And I call a buddy in my office who's become a great friend. And they, they did it themselves. So, uh, yeah. So our new tagline is, you know, the, pro- the buildings are so easy to install. Even your family can do it. And that's our new tagline. What does need to be in place before you drop one of these things down? You got to put something on the ground, right? Like whether it's like a pad. A pad. It depends on the, on the seismic and depends on the topography and the land. You know, a smart engineer will answer that better than me, but you can do piles, you can slab on grade pad. You can do gravel bed. You can do a little foundation wall. You know, in my case, I just did little concrete blocks to set the box, set the houses on and then built my cousin built a deck and you have no idea it's modular. You have no clue. And my, we got to sleep in the cabin, you know, the week after arrived with the boat. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, as we have to talk about, I think anybody on the planet is now in my position, at least who does content is contractually obligated to have to talk about how has COVID-19 impacted your business? So I will ask the obvious question, how has COVID-19 affected Stack Modular's business operations in China and sales outside of China? Well, revenue is an easy answer. Terribly. Mm. Not a lot of new hotels being built throughout COVID, (laughs) right? Not a lot happening in the construction business. And then you go tell a developer, hey, remember that hotel we we're supposed to build together? And all occupancy across North America is like 8% occupancy in hotels. And people can't travel. He's like, actually, I'm not going to build that hotel. So revenue is terrible. From an operational standpoint, we were mid-production. I actually was, I was last in China as COVID broke in Wuhan. And just quite, and if you recall, that was the beginning of Chinese New Year. I was just coming back to Vancouver for Chinese New Year. And we started hearing grumblings, like, oh my God, like, what is this thing? You know, Wuhan's locking down, like what? And so I'm calling, we're, at this time, we're building like 540 rooms for a project here in Canada. So I'm like, I fly home, maybe a week or two goes by, and I'm starting to get frantic calls from all the guys in the plants and the staff and our management. Like, God, like we're about to shut down in China, they're telling me. And I'm saying, you can't shut down. We're in the middle of building 540 rooms. Like, we will be in our contract. So I call our client. Here in Canada, I'm like, guys, like, this is bad news. Like, what am I going to do? And they said, their their answer to me is, figure it out. You sign the contract. This virus you speak of is bogus. Like, figure it out. You can't enact the force majeure clause in the contract because it's not a pandemic. And I'm like, guys, I can't go to work at this point. Xi Jinping and his people have shut us down. 
So I'm now looking at liquidated damages of God knows how much, just probably bankruptcy if we're going to deliver this project on time of 540. Well, if you want to thank God or you want to thank karma or you want to thank whatever, three weeks, three, we get back to work in China. We're behind schedule. We're still concerned about these delay fees. And the client calls us and says, yeah, so this, uh, this virus hit us pretty hard in Canada. I shouldn't laugh to you here. Uh, this virus hit us pretty hard in Canada. Um, we can't receive the modules now. I was going to say, but it's the irony. That's what you're laughing so, about. Remember how friendly you were when we you were know, out? Remember this? Well, now it's a pandemic, they say. So now we actually, they can enact the force majeure clause. Needless to say, we all got along. Project was delivered. But that was a stressful four or five months that, you know, it probably put a few more grays in my head. Yeah. Well, speaking of those gray hairs, how does a, not even a Canadian, but a foreign business person be able to conduct such a massive operation in a place like China? Just just the regulation, the bureaucracy, um, you know, putting up in and managing labor and uh, just everything that you need to do. And you're doing it in a foreign country. And it's not just any foreign country. It's China. Um, even just the occasional, you know, local guys swinging by for a little shakedown. You know what? Uh, you know what? How, how did you do this? What did you go through? You must have amazing stories and a lot of gray hairs from it. You know, you and I were talking earlier that we both got there in our 20s. So, you know, I'm probably lucky I, I didn't know how to run a business in another country at that point. <laughs> you know, like, so if I had moved to China and already was a business owner and I was like, this is all wrong. But to me, it was just like, oh, wow, like, you really got to take a red envelope and go take this guy out for whiskey. And, and that's how it's done. Oh, okay, maybe it's done that way in Canada too. I don't know. Um, so I think the naivety is like a beautiful component of our success early on. But the real, the real answer, man, like naivety will get you a, a year or two, right? The real answer is the people. Like if you can't hire quality people, passionate people, loyal people, then you, you shouldn't be a business owner. The, it's about the people you have. And I don't mean to be a cheesy jerk here, but like the people we have in Shanghai office and certainly here in Canada, but you know, the roots of it is Shanghai office. Like these people define loyal. Like you open the book up in the dictionary, loyal, that there are pictures there, you know, dedicated, there are pictures there. And so if you've got that core group, in our case, you know, 40, and then, you know, outside of that group, you know, the hundreds of factory workers, if you get that loyalty in this group, it goes a long way, man. Goes along. All of a sudden, that guy comes to the factory door and asks for a shakedown. And I got two hundred people. I got two hundred loyal soldiers beside me. It's a different conversation. Let's look into the future. What's uh, what's the future hold for Stack Modular? And potentially that future is kind of on hold uh, for Stack Modular because of COVID. But uh, what's the future hold? Any innovation? Uh, anything new tricks up your sleeve that you guys are working on? Yeah, well, listen, we got through COVID. Like, our revenue's back on. We just landed a really big project yesterday. So, you're calling it a good time. Normally, I'm a huge jerk, but today is a good day. And you're saying to yourself, but you are a jerk. No, um, and we've got some really big awards we're hoping to win next week. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the public domain, meaning provincial, federal, municipal governments, are really pushing modular. So, this year looks awesome. Looks, and it started great. But as far as the future from like a holistic approach, you know, we should be delivering to most first world countries in the world where labor is a concern. We should be. And we should be experts in each of those domains. And you know what? We should be developing for ourselves. Like we're making a lot of other people rich, right? I who owns the Hyatt is making a lot more money than the guy building the Hyatt. Well, you're not in tech, so I think you don't have to worry that much about security concerns that seem to be eating up most of the oxygen in the room when it comes to, uh, you know, the arguing between China and other countries. What about the, you know, quote unquote tariff war um, that the U.S. is having? Does that impact you guys at all? Massively, massively. So, you know, you're kind of just rubbing salt in the COVID wound right now. The COVID year was terrible, as you've heard now a couple of instances, but then all of, sudden, all of a sudden, you know, before COVID, Trump drops a 25% tariff against all Chinese products. 
So all of a sudden, you know, not only were we developing awesome projects in the United States, they were kind of, we could still somewhat compete with the tariff. You know, in a way we've been stuck in Canada for so long, we have a tariff anyways called foreign exchange. <laughs> Canadian dollar, Canadian dollar is approximately 25% less than the American dollar. So it's kind of the same, but it's, you know, all of a sudden you get this hesitation. I think the bigger issue than Trump's tariffs, because Biden still has them in place. The, the, the biggest is the rhetoric. Like, like, I've been pitching China in so many ways for the better part of a dozen years. And I've never seen the negativity that I've now recently seen. Like, I said, I would never, like, answer is like, I would never buy from China. Well, why? You know, like, because Fox News told you not to? Like, come on, man. Like, it's the same people. We just have two governments right now that are squabbling. So, yeah, that's hurting our business more than the tariffs as I see it. We'll get through the tariffs. I think Biden will ease up. We'll get through COVID. We'll be back. I just hope that that rhetoric isn't here to stay. I agree. Um, I don't even know if if, if travel, uh, you know, it, you know, going back and forth and, and people being able to go and visit stuff like if that can alleviate or something. I, I think once you start holding people up in their in their own rooms and where they are and not uh, not allowing to to talk to the neighbors and everybody, somebody get you get behind closed doors and everybody's suspicious about what they're doing across the street. That's very well said. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in our instance, whether you want to use the metaphor of your neighbor and you're not seeing your neighbor enough, and in this instance, we're not seeing our fellow global citizens enough. Yeah. And then we just let we read this news and it's just so negative. Well, listen, you and I have lived in China. We get our horror stories. People always want to hear the horror stories first. But like, those are good people, man. Those are really, really good people. And that's what you don't read in the news. And I love my horror stories. I loved the wild, wild, you know, West, the wild, wild East, you know, that it was, it was so free. It was so fun. And it was born to reward hard work and, you know, a swashbuckling nature. Yeah. Like, like, you know, my grandma, God bless her, probably six, seven years ago when I started really having enough money to bank account to fly to Canada, back to Canada for business trips. Still staying on friends' couches at that point. My grandma would ask, like, what's it like to live in a communist country? And I'm like, I'd have to flip it on my poor grandma. I'm like, you tell me, grandma. Like, you're living in Canada. Like, you can't cross the street with a glass of wine. Like, you got, you, you can't order a wine now with COVID days after 10 p.m. You know, I gotta, how dare I just dwell on like alcohol laws? But like, you get my point. You and I know, like, you live in China, you're free. Don't, don't break the big laws. <laughs> that's not going to go well for you, but you're free. And people don't know that. Like I can do what I want. I work my ass off and, it, and I will succeed. I cannot promise you in Canada, if you work your ass off, you'll succeed. I cannot promise you that because of bureaucracy, there's red tape. There's all these other things that get in the way. China, I find less is in the way of your success. I, I just don't think anybody today, actually, and I said, I'm like, I went through, so I was in tech. So I went through this reverse culture. I went through communist, quote unquote, to capitalist, quote unquote, to socialist, quote unquote. And I'm like, you know what? China was the most capitalist place I've ever been. And I don't know what you think communism is, but I guarantee you China is not it. So you can think what you want of what communism is. And you might be right about what communism is because you read it in a book and you got it defined for you. But if you go to China, you're, you're going to be hard pressed to prove that China is more communist than Canada. We do not cut this out of the podcast. This is golden. That's what people need to hear. This is golden. It is. It is important. It is important. I just, I don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers and I may or may not leave it in. But we'll see. It's it's an important distinction, and we're not trying to be jerks about it and and um, you know overly overdo it. But I just think people should, you know, try to understand how they don't understand the speed of change. Uh, I I think you know forty years ago, yeah, you might be able to say that China may have been you know defined uh, in a, in a communist way out of an encyclopedia, but you have to go there today. You have to see what's going on. It's, and my favorite of the people that you've met them a hundred times is the people with strong opinions or the people that went there once or twice on a business trip or people that have, haven't been there at all. Those are always the people with strong opinions. You get some of yeah. some of us live there for about a year or more. They start speaking like you and I. To wrap this up, who are two or three people that you know of 
who would make great guess that even you, knowing China as well as you do, you would actually listen to them as a guest on this podcast. Okay, I, I, I've got one for you. And I unfortunately haven't connected with him in a few months. We're both busy guys. It's James Parabrelli. We call him out. He started a factory in China right around the same time we did. He left China sooner, but still has his operations and factory there. Similar to us. You know, he's a family guy here, but, you know, has got a great team back in China. But he's he's a, a true speaker. Like, what I mean by that is he will give it to you straight. He will tell you, <laughs> he'll tell you how he got screwed by this guy. And, and uh, he's in the food packaging business. And man, he was, uh, he was, a, he was a blast as, a, as one of my best pals in China when we lived together. Or pardon me, when we partied together. And uh, he'd be good for you. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on the show, buddy. I really appreciate it. This was gold. This was amazing. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being you. Uh, thanks for, for really bringing it and being honest and uh, helping us negotiate the cultural divide between the West and the East. It's been my pleasure, my friend. I look forward to speaking with you again. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation, and if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jing.